And we are uh, beyond excited and honored to, to be here with you today. There. Um, and really grateful for the opportunity to talk about diversity and Christian higher education with a room full of people who know a lot more about it than I do. I am sure I know many of you, none of you have, some of you have no idea who I am, but I know you and I know your work <laughs> and I know your faces because I have followed your work. And so it is, um, it's nerve wracking and exciting to, to be here uh, with you today. Um, Melanie and I, uh, when we crossed paths this past year, uh, we realized we were researching two sides of the same conversation. Um, and so she was looking at students uh, and their perspectives on race in the classroom. And I was looking at faculty and their perspectives on race in the classroom. And so we are, we're, we're so excited to be able to come and share um, what we've been learning from our own research uh, about this conversation, so to speak, between faculty and staff. Uh, in, in the classroom. So I'm going to begin and I'm going to talk about the research project that I've been working on and we'll try and keep it as close to 15 minutes as possible and then she'll follow to talk about her research and then hopefully we'll have some time uh, for questions uh, after that. And then let's see. All right. Well, let's get started. There is a significant body of research regarding the importance of racial and ethnic diversity in higher education. We now have strong evidence that diversity is essential for academic excellence. And schools that do not see an increase in diversity risk being less viable in today's marketplace. This is particularly the case for private Christian colleges, which are influenced by distinctly religious missions and values, but also, frankly, are oftentimes tuition dependent. Oftentimes, all the time, are tuition dependent. <laughs> Um, for these reasons and many others, it's unwise to neglect the important role of diversity in Christian higher education. Now, although there's a robust body of literature on diversity in higher education in general, there's less research when it comes to diversity and Christian higher education. Some of you may uh, have uh, bit read through the recent journal of Christian higher education, and last year they came out with a special issue on diversity. Um, and they highlighted the need for more research in this area and the importance of examining the relationship between religion, diversity, and social justice in Christian academia. Now, while the majority of faculty report that they support and value diversity in education, there is evidence that faculty are more conflicted and less committed to the actual pursuit and practice of diversity in higher education. For example, although faculty may, diverse, uh, may support diversity in principle, uh, many have the misconception <laughs> that diversity inevitably leads to academic, lowered academic standards. And even faculty who strongly advocate for diversity may be much less certain how to deal with race-related tension and conflict likely to arise in racially mixed classrooms. Faculty on the whole, they might be less conflicted about diversity if they're able to hear and learn from faculty who are being intentional about incorporating diversity and social justice into their teaching. It could be argued that faculty who are committed and proactive about pursuing diversity are taking the lead when it comes to a more robust and comprehensive approach to diversity in education. The study I'm gonna be presenting on today focused on the experiences of faculty who teach on diversity and so social justice within the context of Christian higher ed specifically. Um, so what are the specific rewards they experience and the challenges they encounter when teaching on these topics at Christian colleges. So using a grounded theory approach, uh, 14 faculty were interviewed uh, for the current study, uh, and faculty were selected according to the following criteria. They were currently teaching full-time at a CCCU school. They were known for being intentional 
about teaching on diversity, and in particular uh, for this study, in particular multiculturalism. I'm going to use the term diversity, which is obviously, as you you know, is a much broader term. This was spoke. This didn't focus exclusively, but for the most part, when we were talking about diversity, we were talking about multiculturalism. Um, so faculty were known for teaching uh, intentionally about diversity, in particular multiculturalism and social justice, and had experience teaching on diversity and social justice with undergraduate students. And then this isn't on the slide, but I interviewed, uh, I went to four campuses and interviewed faculty at four different CCCU schools. So the final sample of 13 faculty included eight women and five men, seven identified as faculty of color or as being biracial, and six identified as white. Um, years of experience in general ranged from three to over 25 years of experience, and then more specifically, years of experience teaching at a CCU school, uh, CCCU school ranged from uh, a year to over 25 years. And then all of the participants were teaching in a range of disciplines within the humanities, social sciences, or theology and biblical studies. And does anybody realize what's missing from that one? STEM, yeah. All right, these are preliminary findings. I want to be very clear about that from the, from the offset. Um, so these only focus on clear trends or themes that emerged after initial coding. Uh, and oftentimes with qualitative results when they're reported, quotes from participants are used to highlight and illustrate the findings. But because these are preliminary findings, uh, participant quotes are going to be used sparingly. Uh, I just want to be careful to avoid misrepresenting uh, participants' experiences before I've done a more in-depth uh, analysis um, and had a chance to do that. Uh, the initial round of coding focused on the rewards and challenges of teaching on diversity and social justice. Some of the rewards we're going to talk about today um, and that the, that the participants talked about were of a more general nature, so general rewards and challenges and as such you might expect those to be at any college, uh, be experienced at any college or university. And then there were other rewards and challenges that were talked about specifically in terms of teaching on these topics within the context of Christian higher ed. So does that make sense? So I want to talk about general rewards, and then I'm going to end with just focusing specifically on more rewards within this context. All right, so we'll start with general rewards. And not to make this even more complicated, so we have general rewards, and then we have specific rewards, and then within general rewards and challenges, the way what started to come up very clearly from the data is some of the rewards and challenges were more student-oriented, and then some of the rewards and challenges were more focused on what the faculty member themselves experienced. So we'll start with the rewards they experienced in terms of what they observed in their students and in their own lives. So student transformation and student validation were, more, were identified as more student-oriented rewards. Uh, many faculty valued the opportunity to be a part of and witness students' transformative process regarding diversity and social justice. This theme was discussed in a variety of ways, including student learning, student empowerment, student motivation, and students taking action. Almost all of the faculty interviewed shared how rewarding it was when students have aha moments or when they really get it. And you can see it. Um, you can see when like something has just connected with them. And so there were different ways in which faculty discussed that experience. Subsequently, it was meaningful for faculty to see their students motivated to change or take action based on what they'd learned even years after having taken one of their classes. And they would come back and they would tell faculty about something that they were doing in their ministry or work that was directly tied to a class that they had taken from that faculty member. Faculty also reported that they were rewarded by the opportunity to validate students' experiences it was apparent that it was very meaningful for faculty when teaching on diversity and social justice to empower and support marginalized students and to help bring their voices and expertise more fully into the educational process. And now general rewards, but more faculty-oriented rewards. And personal transformation was the big theme that came up here. 
Um, so by far, the most prominent faculty-oriented reward appeared to be the personal growth and transformation faculty experienced as a result of teaching on diversity and social justice. In terms of intrapersonal growth, faculty discuss being challenged to, to engage in their own self-reflective process just as they ask their students to do. This included recognizing and challenging their own biases. For white faculty, several discussed their commitment to understanding the role of white privilege in their own lives. One participant noted that teaching in this area helps hold faculty accountable. Are we being intentional about multiculturalism and anti-racism in our own lives? Beyond intrapersonal growth, faculty also identified uh, rewards related to interpersonal qualities. Uh, and there's actually, there's a pretty long list here. This included being a better listener, being more empathic and understanding of others, being more deliberate about honoring others, openness to other perspectives and ways of being in the world, being more sensitive and less offensive, uh, developing greater humility, and learning how to be non-defensive. <clears throat> So apparently this work can help your marriage as well. <laughs> Many faculty recognize that their personal growth and transformation not only benefited them personally, but also made them better teachers. One faculty discussed becoming a more participatory instructor versus a dispenser of knowledge. Some discussed learning how to be more relaxed and less controlling of the learning process. So challenges. So in addition to the general rewards related to teaching on diversity and social justice, faculty also reported significant challenges. The most consistently reported challenges were related to students, typically white students, lack of awareness regarding race and racism. Faculty reported that white students are often disconnected from their own ethnicity and cultural backgrounds and as such are underdeveloped in terms of their racial and ethnic identity development. One faculty commented how difficult it is to teach on diversity and social justice when white students aren't even aware they have a race. Another major challenge faculty discussed was student defensiveness, resistance, and skepticism, again oftentimes associated with white students. Faculty had to walk a fine line on teaching topics that many students had limited awareness and knowledge of without triggering defensive reactions. So faculty were concerned that if students got defensive in response, then they would shut down, they would withdraw, which then compromises the learning process. Beverly Tatum's book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, was discussed frequently as an important teaching resource. However, faculty also noted that students often responded in a defensive or hostile manner to the reading. So an established, valuable teaching tool was held in tension with the reality that it also generated student resistance. Finally, faculty discussed how challenging it can be to teach effectively on these topics when students are unwilling, afraid, and oftentimes very inexperienced at talking about diversity and social justice. <coughs> and then general challenge, challenges that were more focused on the faculty themselves. Teaching in the area of diversity and social justice also appeared to elicit feelings of uncertainty, anxiety, and self-doubt for many faculty who participated in this study. These feelings of uncertainty and doubt left some faculty ruminating over whether or not they'd handled the situation in class appropriately, if they taught the material effectively, effectively, or wondering if they should have remained neutral or not in class. Many faculty reported struggling with doubts about how successful they were at helping students accurately and empathically understand these issues pertaining to diversity and social justice. Several faculty acknowledge that teaching in this area can be quite painful and exhausting. Some faculty discussed having to deal with their own pain and woundedness that comes up while teaching. At times, these wounds were part of their own past personal experiences. Other times they were a direct result of interactions with students. Given these challenges, it's not surprising that many faculty reported how exhausting teaching on diversity and social justice can be. 
One faculty used the phrase energy sucking, um, which seemed to sum up uh, pretty well the responses of other faculty regarding the toll teaching these topics can take on an individual. So those were general rewards and challenges. So now we're going to transition to the results in terms of the re rewards and challenges uh, specific that were talked about specifically to the context of Christian higher education. And the rewards were talked or organized again around student and faculty. Challenges were organized a little bit differently. So that'll make sense when we get there, hopefully. The primary student-oriented reward in this area, specifically, appeared to be the centrality of one's relationship with God in the educational process. More specifically, faculty appreciated their shared religious commitment with students, oftentimes expressed in students' desire to love God and others more fully. Faculty saw this passion in students as deeply congruent with learning more about diversity and social justice. As such, it provided a religious and therefore more personal avenue for students to begin to recognize that studying diversity and social justice can deepen and strengthen their religious commitment rather than weaken it. In terms of faculty-oriented rewards, integrating matters of faith and justice seemed paramount. Faculty appreciated that they could live out their religious beliefs more openly at a Christian school and integrate matters of faith and justice in their teaching. Oh, there I am, sorry. Helping students do the same uh, was something that seemed to give several faculty an abiding sense of hope despite the challenges they faced. As part of their religious belief system, some faculty believed that God intended his church to be an agent of social change and actively opposed to individual and social injustices. Several faculty noted that Christian colleges and universities are in a unique, if not ideal, place to do this work. Several faculty considered teaching on diversity and social justice as a way to partner with God by helping students be more effective in their own work for the kingdom of God. By teaching students about diversity and social justice, these faculty saw their work as helping achieve the Christian directive to love each other in ways more reflective of the kingdom of God and shalom, which, which obviously is so central to this. And they're helping by, they're partnering with God in their teaching by helping reduce bias and uh, oppression and, and prejudice in the work that they're doing. And then the challenges specific to a Christian context. So the challenges related to teaching on diversity and social justice in Christian higher education seem to revolve pretty strongly around political and theological issues. Faculty discuss the politicized religious culture of American evangelicalism and the social and political conservatism that is often associated with CCCU schools. Faculty reported considerable challenges, including student resistance, tied specifically to political and theological positions held by many students. For many students, diversity and social justice was seen as secular and disconnected from one's faith and perhaps even a threat to one's religious worldview. Faculty also discussed the challenge of students' limited understanding of what scripture says about diversity and social justice, whether it be welcoming the sojourner, intercultural interactions, and reconciliation. Faculty observed that many students adopt a colorblind approach to being one in Christ, which for them means not talking about or acknowledging cultural differences. Faculty also discussed the challenges associated with the strong influence of individualism on students' religious worldviews, which led to resistance to examine more systemic injustices and a subsequent denial of responsibility. And some faculty, uh, they were really saddened um, by the lack of grace some students demonstrated with regard to these topics uh, and issues. And some faculty were really pained by that, um, I, I'll, just from the interviews. Um, those were moments where they were really pained by that. Um, 
So these preliminary findings give us a glimpse into the experiences and perspectives of faculty who teach on diversity, and again, in particular, multiculturalism and social justice in Christian higher education. The transformative aspect of the learning process seemed especially rewarding and meaningful for faculty, not just in their students' lives, but also in their own lives. And I suspect seeing some students really getting the material and making changes in their own lives and the world around them sustains many faculty when faced with significant obstacles and challenges to teaching in this area. A significant challenge appeared to be the lack of awareness and defensiveness seen in some white students. These characteristics are consistent with the first stage or so-called status of Janet Helm's theory of white ethnic identity development. Individuals at the contact status don't think of themselves as white and pay little attention or give minimal significance to their own racial identity. They often display overly simplistic thinking when it comes to race and racism and believe themselves to be colorblind. Knowing how to effectively teach students at this stage of development appears to be an important part of this discussion and research. I want to be careful about drawing too many conclusions from the data since more in-depth analysis has yet to be done. So tentatively, these findings seem to indicate it's important to understand the relationship between the rewards and challenges of teaching in this area. More specifically, the unique opportunities and obstacles faculty face teaching on these subjects in an evangelical context. For instance, religious commitment and the importance of scripture are experienced as both rewards and challenges. And theology played an important role in what motivates faculty to teach on diversity and social justice, but also played a role on what made teaching uh, these topics so difficult at a Christian college. Uh, and it's worth noting, as I'm, some of you are probably already thinking as I'm talking about this, that um, the student's religious emphasis on individualism and a colorblind approach is, is obviously re very consistent with Emerson and Smith's Divided by Faith. Uh, seminal work on race in the evangelical church. Uh, so in conclusion, in light of these challenges faculty reported, there's a possibility that faculty teaching in these areas experience elevated levels of stress and may be a high risk for burnout. These findings can help administrators understand how to effectively support and support these faculty who are teaching on diversity and social justice. In addition to identifying rewards and challenges, Faculty also talked about strategies, which I haven't talked about today. That will be the next part of my analysis, but I think the strategies they offer will also be helpful in this discussion. And I think these findings can help offer important information for faculty wanting to be more intentional about diversity in higher education. Uh, so, because faculty need to be prepared for the challenges that they're going to encounter, but hopefully also be more attuned to the, the rewards and enjoyment that can come from teaching in this area. Thank you. Um, my name is Melanie Holbert. I'm a sociology professor at George Fox University. And interestingly, as Brandy said, so much of my work is the other side of the story here. I'm really, as a white middle class woman who really has no concept of what it means to be obviously a person of color and to experience life that way, I've been really humbled by this research. And I want to thank my students for speaking into this. Um, one of the things I know for sure about students today, let's talk about millennials because millennials are weird <laughs> and awesome. She is technologically brilliant. He's confident and narcissistic. Uh, the youngest are now entering adolescence and the oldest are turning 30. She's open to change and more bipartisan than her parents. He is less religious and more socially aware. They're from the largest generation in American history. So when we compare generations, it's no doubt Gen Xers, right? Accept diversity where millennials celebrate diversity. Gen Xers are pragmatic and practical. Millennials are optimistic and realistic. Gen Xers are self-reliant and individualistic. Millennials are inventive and individualistic. Gen Xers uh, reject the rules, and millennials like to write the rules, as many of us know. Uh, we're into a killer life, and they're into a killer lifestyle. Gen Xers mistrust institutions. Millennials are seeing institutions as completely irrelevant. Let's uh, 
go back to our old days. Gen X is our PCs, millennials are internet. <laughs> We use technology, millennials assume technology. We are multitaskers, they multitask really fast. We were latchkey kids and they got a gold star for everything they did. So you know who they are. You interact with them, you teach them, you're in relationship. Heck, some of you might even be them. Some of you don't understand them, some of you get them and some of you are just wanting to close your eyes to them. Bottom line is though, folks, we need to speak their language and understand their culture if we're ever going to make any movement in breaking ourselves and their, their sense of um, understanding diversity. So that's the context I'm coming from. I come from George Fox University. Um, these are the best pictures, they're sunny. That's about once every 25 days in Oregon. I started my journey in grad school in New York and started really having my heart broken at that time uh, as I realized what it meant to be white and to have privilege and how, how could I abide in that category. I was asked to read seminal works by Macintosh and W.E.B. E. Dubois. And then after a while, I had to set that on the shelf because I, I wanted to think about it, but I really didn't want to think about it. I spent my early career working on issues of gender and work and I jumped into that community of scholars and I was happy and comfortable and it was interesting. I got a job and then something terrible happened on my campus in 2008. 2008, beginning of the semester, right around election time, uh, Obama effigy was found hanging from a tree on our campus. And it absolutely hit us square in the face that this was something we needed to talk about. I also was invited to teach, for the first time, race and ethnicity at that exact same time. So it became very obvious that this was an opportunity, absolutely, to have my students talk about this. I had to return to that shelf. I had to take down my white privilege. I had to pick up my own journey. You know, I've tried it all. As a person that wants to connect with my students, which we all are, I've tried, to do, I've tried to create safe places. I've tried to structure the class into groups. I've invited guest speakers to come spill their hearts and talk about their journeys. I've even attempted to model the practice of saying things that are often really scary to talk about. But at the end of the day, what did I find? My students weren't doing that. They were just so polite to each other. Are Biola students, are your students like that? They're so polite and I was sick of it. <laughs> so I developed an assignment and I asked them, I'm not gonna read this whole thing to you, I said, look, write a letter to someone of a different racial ethnic group and in that letter, I want you to say the things that you would never say out loud. I want you to express your hurt, your anger, your frustration and do so openly. And as you write this letter, what would you wanna say? What would you wanna express? What do you think about race and ethnicity? So I started doing that in 2008, and after about three years, I started to see some themes. And as any good qualitative researcher, I thought, hmm, there's some research going on here. Bottom line, I found that my students had a lot to say. And if I could get them to say it in the classroom and not just on paper, we could transform hearts and transform lives. So let me share with you quickly my methods. I have done content analysis of over 120 of these letters. I've done focus groups with different racial ethnic um, groupings, and I've also done in-depth interviews with 10 students as well. Emergent theme, first I wanna talk about amongst my white students. I don't think this will be a surprise to you, this theme of fear and internalized racism. Each year, the white students, which are by far the majority in my classrooms, have expressed how their anxiety and their fear and their awkwardness prevent them from even speaking about racism. You know, in a context of white fear, in a time when political correctness and conciliatory values permeate American culture, these students grew up hearing the word celebrate diversity. They've heard it over and over and over again. Yet at the same time, they know that because of this, there's this sense that to say something out loud, to say something that might be seen as racist, really prevented that. 
Throughout all these letters is a strong theme of white students needing to both self-protect and engage in impression management. In today's classroom, the racial dialogue has changed. A lot of my students say, well, racism was in the 60s. I saw it. I've seen it on television. I've read it in books. It doesn't happen anymore. I'm sure you've heard your students say that. Especially now that we have our first black president, we are a post-racial society. These students exist in a world where the language of diversity and multiculturalism is embedded in their genetic code. But they are highly aware that they run the risk of saying something and mistakenly be seen as antiquated or racist, or as one student said, like my grandfather. So what's the result? Too many polite students. <laughs> Why do we need these classes? I echo what Brandy says. When we really stop to look at it, knowledge about race and ethnicity should absolutely be a part of a 21st century liberal arts education. It shouldn't just be housed in sociology or psychology or theology. It needs to be in every class and in creative ways. Students today understand more about race and ethnicity as systems of distinction versus as something that is constructed and created. And it's hard for students, particularly white students, to believe that racism still exists because when they recognize that they benefit from layers of privilege, of being white, of being heterosexual, of being middle class, of being male, it becomes difficult. So I want to share with you some of my findings and suggest some alternative ways of thinking about this and a strange turn of events that I happened upon as I conducted my research. Some of the coping mechanisms that students used. Again, I'm talking about my white students at this time. A lot of students at this stage use their non-racist credentials. Have you heard this before? Well, I have a lot of black friends. I don't see color. I just see their heart. I don't feel white. I'm not like other white people. My grandfather didn't own slaves. The fear of being seen or thought of as racist is salient in the lives of today's students. And here's the thing, if we're fearful too, because we've grown up in the same kind of language, if teachers are fearful about having open racial dialogues in the classroom, that fear is real because what do we fear? We fear losing control. We fear that the dialogue will create antagonism. Who likes conflict? And we also fear that if we step into that unknown territory, we might, in fact, venture into some shaky ground. Go there. Go there. The students want us to go there. They want us to demonstrate. One of the first things I say in my class is, I am a white middle class woman. What do I know about race? But I do know one thing. I'm a recovering racist. And I've been unlearning those messages my whole life. And just to admit it out loud is hard for me. I don't want to say that, but I am. It's a reality. So I want to be honest. I want to share with you quickly a quote from one of my white students. Do you know that I would love to spend a day in your shoes? Now, this is a white student talking to a, a black friend. The thing is, I feel like I have no idea what it must be like to be you. But I could never say that to you because I've seen what happens to white people when they ask silly questions like that to people of color. Others have said, I feel really uncomfortable talking about race because I don't know enough about race. I don't even know what race is because I don't have a race. I don't have the knowledge. So Sue, in uh, work in 2010, argues that few studies have attempted to classify the characteristics. For students, they're worried about the emotion that they might experience. They're worried about what's going to feel like psychologically. And they wonder, what's the difference between a successful comment and what's the, an example of a failed comment? So one of the things I do, and I can't wait to talk to some of you to hear how you're doing this with your white students. I want my students to see what whiteness is. I oftentimes will put them on this particular white dialectics brought up by Todd. 
because I want my students to understand that their tension about race is really normal. And what Todd suggests is that students, first of all, need to recognize where they stand in terms of their sense of whiteness. Do they feel that they need to deny their whiteness or they're unaware of being white? Or do they say, yeah, white means something? Also, what about their relationships with others? Are there barriers and bridges? And then I want them to think about, OK, I want you to think about yourself. But what do you think about racism today? Do you minimize it? Do you recognize it? Are you color blind or color conscious? And I do this through, I don't just say, hey, where do you fit on this? I give them ways and journeys and assignments to do this. So from the individual to the social and now to the structural. One of the first things students will say is, if you just work hard enough, you can do anything. That's true, absolutely. But the playing field, as we know, isn't set up that way. Now, I'm a sociologist. Of course, I study that structural component. And that white privilege really does mean something. White fear, fear of appearing racist, fear of realizing one's racism, fear of confronting white privilege, and fear of taking responsibility to end racism. Now. There's so much more to this, but I want to protect your time because something interesting happened when I began to sit down with students of color. Something very surprising to me. So I sat down with a group of students in focus groups and I said, look, I'm going to read some letters to you from white students. What do you think? How do you explain white fear? Speculate what white fear is, where it comes from, and how they would respond to this fear. But as you can imagine, I heard a lot more about how they felt about being a person of color on a predominantly white campus. First thing they said, you know what, as I hear about this white fear, I'm not surprised. Another thing students said is I'm angry, I feel offended. But the most interesting theme was this sense of feeling bad about themselves. They were aware of the political and social changes that have put the white majority at a disadvantage. And they felt that it was their fault. Here's what one African American student said. I have definitely experienced white fear. I'm nervous that my friends of color will think I'm just like the rest of them, and I wouldn't want to appear racist or anything. Now, for an African-American student to say, I've experienced white fear, I had to kind of have him unpack that for me. White people live in a time when they are told that their lack of color represents a unique, oppressive, and shameful past. While my hybrid color represents a bold, unabashed, and enlightened future. I live in an academic world where administrators seem more happy to have me than any white kid on campus. And why not? I'm a testament to how far we have come. Whereas white kids today aren't any surprise, anything new, and really nothing special, this makes me sad, but I'm afraid this is the time we live in. So for some of these students, they felt powerful and special. This awareness made them feel special, but for most students, the dominant theme I found was shouldering the fear. As the students of color listened to the letters, a general tone of understanding came from groups. They nodded their heads. They hung their heads. Many of them speculated that the white students were fearful because they had probably been hurt by a person of color. This internalized racism, right? What's internalized racism? It's when the minority group internalizes the racism that is occurring in society, takes it on, begins to believe it themselves. This negatively shapes the way they see themselves. And research shows that internalized racism will often give rise to patterns of thinking and feeling and behaving where they begin to minimize their own experience, criticize their own experience, invalidate their own experience. Here's what one African-American woman said. Inside, I feel angry sometimes, but I know that I don't want to be seen as that angry black woman. 
And I wonder how do they, other people of color, deal with this kind of stuff? Because sometimes I feel like I'm going crazy here. And I feel like I'm the most angry person ever. But when my black friends tell me to get over it, I'm like, I thought we were like supposed to feel like me. And she laughs. For these students, any behavior that showed their frustration was putting them at risk of being judged themselves. And in order to avoid that, they became white allies. They empathized with their white friends. They validated their fears by saying things as, I can't give up here. I have to be the one to change the stereotypes about black women. I have to be the one to do the work and reconcile with them because they've been hurt by people like me. I feel like I have to help them understand why they feel closed off. For me, personally, I think this is our fault that we don't let them know anything about our culture. We're always crying, we are the minority, we are the minority, and that is our excuse because we don't want them to come see what we are about. Of course they don't want to ask us any questions because they're afraid we're gonna call them racist, and sometimes we do. To make ourselves feel better, we turn that anger back on them. We gotta fix this. So by affirming the validity of their white friend's fear, the students of color are accepting the stereotypes that white culture has of people of color. So this idea of really privileging the white experience. Have you seen this in your classrooms? Have you talked to your students of color about this? So I had to jump into the literature. And I'll begin wrapping up here. White mainstream members of society are the dominant group. And assimilation has been the way for people of color to enter into that. And so this idea of acting white is very common. Acting white is a phenomenon that really is a way of coping. It's a way of being accepted. Acting white also paid off academically. And this is what my students of color were experiencing. They were playing a role. One girl said, last year when my floor had group dinners every week, I couldn't really be myself. I, could use, I couldn't even use slang or my city talk. When I asked her why she said that, she said, because I knew it would make the white girls feel uncomfortable. And they would be like, why is she talking like that? It's just easier sometimes for me to act white. I want them to know that just because I'm from the city doesn't mean I don't know how to speak. So although acting white was a way to ward off racial awkwardness, it penalized some as well because they still, even though they acted white, they still were left to the margins. My respondents were telling me that role playing also seemed to happen in the classroom, that they felt like they had to act white, they had to speak white in their classrooms. They had to play certain roles. They either had to be the cultural sport spokesperson where a faculty would say to a student of color, so as a black woman, tell us about gospel music. <laughs> tell us about what Hispanic food is like, Rodrigo. <laughs> to provide information about their own or others racial ethnic group, that's a burden to have to educate their classmates. Also, there's the interventionist. Students of color in the center of conflict, when they try and insert their own contextualized story, they become the interventionists between their friends of color and the white students. And then the angry minority, another role that they were often asked to play. This is when students of color felt they had reached the point of no return when they were chastised. So what I want to suggest to you as a group is that internalized racism leads to self-regulation and the, potentially the denial of self. And if you have students in your classroom who are doing this, think of the mental and emotional energy they're spending. When their goal is to be thinking academically and critically and studying. So some of my takeaways for you today. As educators, are you aware of your educational approaches that can contain elements that may be seen as discriminatory? Students of color or from other marginalized groups often felt as if their thoughts were invalid or unimportant as a result of kind of shutting down. So what can we do? First, know yourself. I have to do this every, every day. Humanize the curriculum. 
I ask myself these questions. Am I making oversimplified statements? Am I perpetuating stereotypes? Do I allow derogatory statements to just fly and not say anything about it? I also want to encourage us to steer away from texts and teaching strategies that rely on essentialized notions of race and ethnicity. And I want to make sure that each of my topics and classes discuss from multiple and opposing viewpoints. Who am I choosing to be authors in terms of my textbooks? Who's not in the mainstream that voices need to be heard? And always be having an awareness of the class climate. Another thing I want to encourage you, and these are my last two comments is that when I take responsibility for debunking generalized racist comments about people of color, then my students feel more comfortable speaking up. Ask students, why is it hard to talk about this? What does diversity mean to you? So although there's so much more to talk about, about white students and students of color and the mixture of them all in one classroom together, I want your classrooms to be a place where you not just teach about inequality, but you model yourself how to deal with it, how to talk about it, and to hold yourself accountable to your own prejudices. Continue in this dialogue, and I really would love to talk more with you if you have interest in this. Thank you so much for today. And look, it is 1.30. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.